<laughs> okay, folks, uh, let's get started. I have this on. So, how's the pendulum going? Did anybody else get it balanced as yet? Not yet. I, I saw at least four or five groups that were really close. So hopefully, hopefully this week we see a handful more groups uh, get it going. And like I said at the beginning of this lab, this is one that it, it's a real challenge. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. And it may be the case, like I've said a few times, that if you get it balanced, then there's bonus points or something of that variety. We'll, we'll see how hard this actually is. Um, what I wanted to show you before we got into today's content is just something that I thought folks might be interested in, which is this system from the little sticker says, let me see here, 1982. <laughs> uh, th this is what this class used to be taught with. In 1982, this is a Verano box. Is that right, Bruce? Um, so the the whole course, you know, 1982 microcontrollers weren't really too available as yet, not for a class like this in any case. Um, so the notion was that if you were a student in this class, you you or your group, I'm not sure, would get this box, and this was sort of your mobile lab. You could plug it in, and everything that you implemented would be TTL logic. So you know, you'd build your own sort of log digital logic circuits here, and uh, a handful of weeks ago, or maybe a couple of months ago, Bruce and I plugged this in, and it actually still boots just fine. The power all still works, so you can still prototype TTL stuff here, and it would be just fine. So, kind of interesting, I think, because um, this isn't that long ago, <laughs> really, at all, right? So, it's kind of amazing how, how far it's come. Um, I don't know. And I got to be staring at this thing. The notion of kind of a mobile lab for this class, I kind of like. We might, maybe in some coming years, we'll resurrect this philosophy of having sort of a mobile lab that you could carry around. Because it occurs to me that with the Pico, if the Raspberry Pi availability becomes a little bit better, it'd be kind of interesting, I think, to program the Pico from a Raspberry Pi. And then in, you know, a modestly sized box like this, you could fit a breadboard, you know, a little power supply, maybe one of those low fidelity, but very cheap scopes little screen, you know, you could fit everything that you needed for this class into something that was not much differently sized than this. And then everyone could sort of have their mobile lab with them, bring it into the lab, we could work, you could take it home, you could work. I think it'd be kind of a neat model for this class. So I don't know, maybe in the coming years. Plus, it would just be a fun mechanical project to try to design something like that. So anyway, I just thought that was very cool. Um, what I'd like to talk about today, let me pull my laptop back up, is I told you last time that, um, let me share my screen here. I told you last time that today we were going to talk about music synthesis stuff. And I didn't finish the demos in time. <laughs> I'd like to run some demos for that lecture and uh, I need an extra day to get some stuff together. So instead of talking about that today, I think we'll save that till Friday. Um, what I thought we would do instead is do a a deeper dive into driving the stepper motors. And I'd like to do this for a couple of reasons. One is I've gone through all your project proposals. By the way, um, I've added some comments to all your project proposals on Canvas. For most groups, the, pro the, the comment might be as minimal as looks great. Um, there were a handful of groups where I made a few suggestions. The one I would say sort of general comment that I can make to everyone is, um, I saw a lot of video game proposals, which is fantastic. If you're going to implement a video game, all that I would ask is make your control input to the video game something physical, buttons, switches, you know, joysticks, that kind of thing, just to exercise a few more features of the microcontroller and add some sound effects. Um, both make the game more fun to play, I think, and also both cause the they forced you to use a few more pieces of the microcontroller that we've gone through throughout the semester. So I think it's a good exercise. Um, but other than that, everything looked pretty good. So, so I thought we'd go over stepper motors today because there were a couple of projects that were suggested where I think a stepper motor might be a nice aspect of that project. And even for those projects that aren't going to use stepper motors, this discussion will allow for us to revisit DMA channels which will be of general relevance, I think, to a lot of groups. 
And it also allows for us to revisit the PIO system, which may be of relevance to a number of you. Um, so it's sort of a nice opportunity to do for us to do kind of a review session, but through a particular case study for a particular actuator. So before we get started in the details, let me just briefly remind you about the internal mechanism of a stepper motor. Uh, we talked about this last time or a couple times ago, but let me just remind you that inside of a stepper motor, the, the internal mechanism of a stepper motor is different than that of a DC motor. And it looks something like this, where we have a couple of, of um, cores here, which we can magnetize in either direction using a, a loop of wire that's wrapped around them. And then inside of these two magnetic cores, there's a permanent magnet that is free to rotate. And the notion here is that by changing the direction of current through these loops of wire that surround one or the either core, we can set up a single stable configuration for this internal permanent magnet. And this is a simplified picture in that, you know, there, there's only sort of, uh, you know, a handful of possible orientations of this. In an actual stepper motor, there are maybe up to like a thousand, four thousand steps to compose a single rotation here. So there's many, many more stable configurations. Um, so you look at this and, and suppose that you picked up a stepper motor out of like a bucket and you knew that the internal mechanism was something like this, but you weren't sure of the pinout. What's a simple way to deduce the pinout of a stepper motor given this sort of internal mechanism? Shift register. Shift register, how do you mean? I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so incidentally, this, this picture that we're looking at here, this is sort of a schematic view of a four input stepper motor. You might see other versions of stepper motors with six inputs, which we can, we can talk about if it's relevant, but the ones that we have in lab are four inputs. So I thought we'd focus on this. But one thing that you might do is, you know, there's gonna be an input coming out of each of these, these leads here. Uh, measure the resistance across them. If you get two leads and you, you measure a finite resistance across those two leads, then you know that, okay, these two, you know, compose, the, the, these two are two ends of this loop of wire that wraps around the, one of the cores inside. If you find infinite resistance, then you know, okay, these two are wrapped around different cores. And you can start to sort of deduce with the multimeter which inputs go to where here. And then figuring out the precise control sequence might take some experimentation if you have absolutely no data sheet, but you could figure that out as well with just, you know, experimenting which, which ones you turn on and off and so on. Um, so I want to, I want to look at the code in just a moment, but let's think about this just a little bit further. Suppose, suppose that this motor was being controlled so that the magnet were stably in this orientation. What that would mean is that we would have current going through this particular loop of wire such that this was a south pole and this was a north pole. So you can imagine that in order to do that, we would be sending, you know, current through here such that we were creating magnetic field this way so that this became north, this became south. And suppose we wanted to click it to an orientation that was halfway between these two magnetic cores. The way that we would do that is we would want for this and this to both be south poles, which means that we would maintain the current through this loop of wire and also turn some current on through this loop of wire in the particular direction that makes this a south pole. Doing that incidentally is called half stepping the stepper motor because we're going halfway between these two cores here. Right. And then suppose we wanted to step it once further. So we wanted it to be rotated 90 degrees so that north was pointed here. Well, then in that case, we would want for this to be a south pole, right? And we might turn off any magnetization of this other core and so on and so on and so on. In order to, to, to cause for this to rotate through one full rotation, what that would require is first of all, turning on and off the current in these two loops of wire. And second of all, switching the direction of current through those two, two loops of wire because at various points throughout this rotation, we would want for this to be a south pole and this to be a north pole. But then once this is 180 degrees, we would want for this to be a north pole and this to be a south pole, which means we would have current going through the magnetic, through the loops here in the opposite direction. So if all you had was the stepper motor and you didn't have a stepper motor driver, which is 
something that you often get along with the stepper motor. But if all you had was the stepper motor, you would probably do something like hook up an H bridge to each of these loops of wire so that you could drive current in either direction through them. And then the exercise would be controlling each of those two H bridges so that you were changing the direction of current through each of these things step by step by step to click this along through its various orientations. Often, often instead, of, you could do that, right? But often what you do instead is get a stepper motor driver along with the stepper motor that basically does that for you. It, it will have, in our case, for the particular motors that we have in lab, four inputs that represent these four inputs. And by modifying the digital signal that you send to those four inputs, it will automate the H bridge manipulations that cause for current to flow in one direction or the other direction through these cores. We'll look at that in just a second. Quick questions about this. So as I mentioned last time, you know, what are you not going to use this kind of motor for? High speed stuff, right? If you're trying to build some sort of a persistence of vision project, which one of the groups in here is going to build, yeah. Uh, you're not going to be using stepper motors because you want for something to spin at, I don't know, probably over 20 RPM or rotations per second or something, which you're not going to get speeds like that out of the stepper motor. What these are really good at is lots of torque at low speeds. So if you want to yank on an Etch-a-Sketch, it's really good for that. If you want to open the vents of an HVAC system, it's really good at that. Um, they're nice for maintaining position knowledge because you can count the number of steps that you do in either direction. Right, so they're good for these sorts of applications. So what I want to talk about next is a PIO based driver for a stepper motor with this kind of internal mechanism. And the degrees of freedom that that driver allows for you to configure is what they include which direction do we want for the motor to rotate? How fast do we want for the motor to rotate? And through how many steps do we want for the motor to rotate in either direction? Right, so those are the three degrees of freedom that this particular driver that we're going to discuss allow for you, the user, to configure. Questions? Okay, in that case, Let's go to the course website and I want to pull up the in the application section there's a page on the stepper motor driver and I'm not going to talk through this this whole page here, but I do just want to pause for a moment on. Um, this particular graphic which gives a schematic view of the driver that we're about to discuss so the driver that we're about to discuss makes use makes use of both of the PIO blocks. Remember from our conversation a while ago about the PIO subsystem that there are two separate PIO coprocessors, PIO0 and PIO1, each of which has up to four state machines that it can contain. And the fundamental limitation that we talked about is the total number of instructions contained in either of these PIO blocks spread among all the state machines may not exceed 32. Right, so in PIO zero, we have 32 instructions to spend. In PIO, in PIO one, we have 32 instructions to spend. We may distribute those instructions among up to four different state machines, which you can think of as programs, right? But our fundamental limitation in each of these things is 32 instructions. And the, the, the particular driver that we're gonna look at uses each of the two state machines to drive two different stepper motors. And I wanna talk through this at sort of a high level first, and then we'll go into the, the details of the code of this. Um, so I mentioned in a previous lecture that the mechanism by which different state machines in the same PIO block can signal to one another is these interrupts. They're called interrupts. They behave a little bit more like flags, to be honest with you, but we'll, we'll take a look at this. So, so the, the way that this works is, the driver on a particular PIO state machine that controls a single motor, it does so with three state machines. Um, what the first state machine does is from the user, from user input, it pulls the number of steps that should be executed by the stepper motor. Th through how many steps do we want for this motor to step? It pulls that information in through a pull command, as we'll see. So it pulls that from the TX-FIFO into the output shift register. 
It'll then copy that number of steps from the output shift register into one of the scratch registers. And it's going to use this to keep track of how many steps have we executed so that it executes just the right amount. Um, it then goes to, it'll enter a, a loop where in the loop, it will signal to a second state machine. The second state machine will be responsible for controlling the speed with which we send subsequent pulses to the stepper motor, right? So this is controlling the number of steps that we execute. This next state machine, which is getting signaled by the first one, will control the speed with which those steps are executed. And then the final state machine is signaled by the second one. And what this is going to do is actually put the control sequence out onto pins that communicate to the motor driver to actually execute one of those steps. And you can imagine that it's this state machine that's going to control the direction that the motor turns, right? Because it's going to be executing some pull commands to get the particular control sequence that we want to send out to the stepper motors. If we send it, you know, um, one particular control sequence, it turns in one direction. If we send another control sequence, mirror image of it, it goes in the other direction. We'll take a look at this. Um, all of these are going to be fed by DMA channels, as we'll look at. And then the whole system will send an interrupt back to the ARM processor when it's finished executing maneuver. So that's, that's a lot of information sort of waving my hands, but I just, I want to give you a high level view of what this is going to do before we go into the details. So let's take a look at the code here. Um, go to the course demo code. I want to look in particular in the stepper motors directory at position and speed control. And I want to start by looking at the first of those state machines I mentioned. This is the state machine that is responsible for counting the number of steps that we have executed. So it pulls in from the user the number of steps that the user would like for the motor to move through. And it counts the number of steps that have been executed and then stops the motor from moving and signals back to the processor when it's completed that. So the mechanism by which it does that is, so, so as before, you know, we, we indicate the start of a program with a dot program and then a program name. The first instruction in this program is a pull block. Remember, we talked about this pull command. What this does is move information from the TX FIFO. This is the FIFO that sits between the ARM processors and the PIO state machines. And it's the FIFO that's in the direction from the ARM to the PIO state machines, right? So it moves information from the TX FIFO into the output shift register, which is one of those registers that lives within this particular state machine. The block here means in the event that there is no data in that TX FIFO, wait on this instruction until data appears. So we execute a pull block in the event that the user has sent, you know, some instruction to the system to execute some number of steps that that number appears in the TX FIFO. This instruction, when that number appears in the TX FIFO, will move that information from the TX FIFO into the output shift register. The next instruction is a move, which moves that number of steps that we would like for the motor to be to, to traverse from the output shift register to the X scratch register. Is there another, another instruction we could have used in place of this? That's a hard question. <laughs> that, that would have required that you really kind of go into the data sheet. We could have alternatively used a, um, an out command here. The out command speaks specifically to the output shift register and it is of the form out. And then you specify a destination where you would like the data moved to. So it's moving from the output shift register to a destination. That destination might be the pins. It might be the X scratch register, the Y scratch register. Um, so we, and, and then the other piece of information that that instruction requires is the number of bits. So instead of this instruction, we could have alternatively put out X 32, which would have meant move 32 bits from the output shift register to the X scratch register. Either would have worked. In any case, we have a move command here. We then enter this loop. The first instruction that we execute in this loop is an ERC wait two. The way to read this is, is signal interrupt number two. So it sets that interrupt flag, interrupt number two. 
and wait for it to be cleared. So signal interrupt two, and then don't pass this instruction until something else, whoever's receiving that interrupt has cleared it. So it will sit here and wait. We'll see what clears that in just a moment. Once that interrupt get, gets cleared, it executes a jump instruction where it says, in the event that X is non-zero, jump back to the count loop and execute this interrupt again. And remember that this jump instruction, it evaluates the value of X and then decrements it. So in the event that X was one, it would say, uh, is one non-zero? Oh yes, indeed it is. So I'll jump back up here. And as I'm jumping, I'll decrement that to zero. And then next time I encounter this jump, I would pass through here because it would ask, is X greater than zero or non-zero rather? The answer would be no. We would move past this and signal this next interrupt, which we'll talk about in a moment. The, the interpretation of this instruction is very similar to this instruction. The way to read this is signal interrupt number zero and wait for it to be cleared. As we'll see in just a moment, Interrupt two, which is being signaled here, gets cleared by another state machine in the PIO system. Interrupt zero will get cleared by the processor. This is our signal back to the processor that the whole, the whole maneuver has been executed, right? Because we will only reach this line after we've gone through this loop um, the number of times that the user specified. This is going to be our mechanism by which we're counting steps. Okay, so all this is doing is pulling the number of steps that we want for the motor to move through. And then it's entering this loop. It will move through this loop as many times as the number of steps that the user wants. Each time it signals an interrupt and waits for it to clear. And then as soon as it clears, it goes back and signals that interrupt again and waits for it to clear. Once it's done that, the number of times that it's supposed to, it signals a, a different interrupt, interrupt zero, and waits for that one to clear. We'll see how both are interpreted in just a second. Okay. So this is all that this is responsible for doing is counting number of steps. So, so who's receiving interrupt two here? Well, let's take a look at a second PIO program in here, which is the PACER program. I mentioned previously that the degrees of freedom that we're trying to allow for the user to manipulate here include the direction that the motor turns, the number of steps through which the motor turns, and the speed with which it turns through those steps. That first state machine that we just looked at is counting the number of steps. This state machine that we're about to look at is enforcing the speed with which we move through those steps. Okay. So the first thing that we, the, the first instruction that we have here is an out instruction. So this is moving 32 bits from the output shift register to the X scratch register. And in the comments here, in all caps, I have auto pool engaged, right? So this is to indicate that we'll look down here in the moment, but we have auto pool configured such that as soon as we have counted 32 bits as having been shifted out of the output shift register, it automatically pulls more information in. That saves us that pull instruction, okay? We then enter this count loop this is all that this is doing is delaying it's just sitting here and spinning for as many cycles as is as is indicated by this x scratch register we'll see in a moment how the user actually feeds this but this is enforcing a delay right so we're going through the the state machine that's responsible for counting steps gets to step one signals this state machine this state machine it, it, it will be waiting here, incidentally, this wait one erc two. The way to read this is wait at this instruction for interrupt two to be signaled. That will be signaled by that first state machine that we looked at. When it's signaled, this one means clear it. So as statement, the first state machine is running, this one will also be running, but it will get to this instruction and wait for its signal. As soon as it gets that signal from the first state machine, it moves past this line and, and at the same time it clears that interrupt so that the first state machine that we looked at continues on and goes and gets ready for the next step, right? As soon as it passes this line, it signals its own interrupt, ERC3. No weights or anything. This is, this, it just signals this and then goes back up here, executes another delay and waits for the next signal to, to do its next thing. So the first state machine is just counting steps. For each step that it counts, it signals this state machine that waits for a certain amount of time. 
after it has waited for the dedicated amount of time, it signals interrupt three, and we're about to see who receives interrupt three. Interrupt three is received by the final PIO program that composes this driver. This one's only two lines. All that this does is wait one ERC three. The way to read that is wait for interrupt three, wait on that instruction for interrupt three to be signaled. As soon as you receive it, clear it. And then as soon as it's cleared, it executes an out instruction, the destination being pins and the number of bits that we want to move being four. We execute an out pins four, which means move four bits from the output shift register out to the pins. And then we have auto pull enabled here with our threshold being four bits, which means as soon as we've shifted four bits out of the output shift register, we automatically pull more information into the output shift register. And as we'll see in a moment, when we look at the C code that actually drives these PIO programs, the information that we're pulling into this particular state machine is the control sequence that manipulates, that digitally manipulates that stepper motor driver. So all this state machine does is it spends most of its life sitting there on line four and just waiting for a signal. As soon as it receives that signal, it pops the next step out onto the control input to the stepper driver and then moves back up and waits for its next signal, executing an auto pool in the meantime. Is that okay with people? And incidentally, you, if you read about this, there, there, all of those PIO programs could actually live in the same file. You can specify different PIO programs in the same file. So this is it, this directory includes more files than it would actually have to. Just when I was putting it together, it helped me to separate these things in my head. Um, the next thing that I want to look at is the C program that goes on the ARM processors that actually feeds these motor drive the, these uh, PIO state machines. So what does that look like? So, so we see a number of includes at the top that suggest all the libraries that this driver is going to use. In particular, we're going to be accessing the, the PIO interface, the DMA interface, the interrupt interface, right? And then we've also included these .pio.h files. These are the header files associated with each of those PIO programs that the compiler has automatically built for us. All right, so this allows for us to sort of include those PIO programs into our project, we include them as such. The next thing that we see is a, a few pound of fines just to make our, make our code a little bit more readable. We'll see how these are used in just a moment, but we're associating the word counterclockwise with the number two, the word clockwise with the number zero, the word stop with, or with number one, the word stop with the number zero. And then the next thing of interest here that I want to point you to are, are these, these character arrays with names like pulse sequence forward, pulse sequence backward, and pulse sequence stationary, each of which contains an array of characters which describe each of these, each of these values. If you were to convert those values from hex to binary, there will be four zeros followed by um, a combination of ones and zeros that represent the digital inputs that are going into the motor driver. So for instance, uh, pulse sequence backward here, the, the first character in that character array is hex one, which means all zeros in a one. What that corresponds to is for these four inputs, Three of them will be zero and one of them will be one, right? So maybe in this case, you know, we're just putting current through this particular loop, not through this loop to, to polarize it in a certain direction. And then the next character in that character array would be hex three, which means all zeros. And then the three least significance bits would be, uh, would be what? Zero, one, one, which means which corresponds to two of these inputs being high. That would be us half-stepping this, right? We'd be polarizing each of these cores. The next one would be, the next element in that array would be uh, hex two, which means 
all zeros, and then the least significant three bits would be zero, one, zero, which means we've then stepped it 90 degrees. We've turned off the first core and we have maintained polarization on the second core, right? So we're encoding those digital inputs to this motor driver in these character arrays. Notice incidentally that pulse sequence stationary is just a, an array of zeros. That is to say, don't send any control inputs. The motor's just gonna sit still, right? If we're not polarizing anything. And then pulse sequence forward and backward are just mirror images of one another. If you reverse the control sequence, you reverse the direction that the motor turns. Okay. And then the next thing that we do is we, we declare a few variables that we're gonna use to configure our DMA channels that are actually feeding these things. In particular, we have a pointer to an unsigned car called address pointer motor one that points to the address of the first element of that pulse sequence forward character array. Could I have written that more tidily? This here. What is the name of an array in C? What, what does that actually correspond to? Yeah. It's a pointer to the first item. It's a pointer to the first item. So I could, I believe, alternatively have just put the name of the character array there, and that would have been the same, right? I just, this was helping me think about it. Uh, and then likewise, we have a, a pointer to, two pointers to unsigned ints that point to the addresses of two variables, one called pulse length motor one, the other called pulse count motor one. Their names kind of suggest how they're going to be used, right? These are going to be the information that gets pulled into the output shift registers of the two state machines that are responsible for counting number of steps and for controlling the speed with which the motor turns. And then there's similarly named stuff for the other motor, okay, but it's exactly the same logic. So, okay. And then we have a few macros defined here that sort of start to describe our API for this driver. The first is move steps motor one. The way to interpret this is please move motor one this many steps. And as an argument, this takes the number of steps that you would like for motor one to turn. And the way that it does this is it, it changes the value of that variable called pulse count motor one to whatever you've specified. And it starts the DMA channel that feeds the uh, state machine, which, which counts steps. That's what starts the whole process. It's just starting that DMA channel. Setting the speed of a particular motor is it, all that that requires is simply changing the value of the variable that specifies the amount of delay that we would like between step inputs. And then setting the direction of the motor, what we do there is we set the value of this address pointer motor one, which we'll use to specify the source address for a DMA channel. We change it to point to either the forward sequence character array or the reverse sequence character array or the safe still sequence character array, right? And we'll see, we'll see that configuration in the DMA channel. But, but because we're driving this whole thing with DMA channels, you know, basically all that we have to do is change the values at the memory addresses to which we are pointing these different DMA channels and everything else just sort of happens automatically. The DMA just still goes to that address, get whatever, gets whatever information is there. If we've changed it, then it changes. Okay. Let me go through and, you know, we, we do some things to make things a little bit more readable. So we declare two objects of type PIO. This is a CSDK thing. One called PIO0, the other called PIO1. We specify which state machines we're going to use. Zero, one, and two. Remember that there are four state machines available on each PIO channel. This is just to make our code a little bit more readable. We're going to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to put the pulse generating state machine on state machine zero, the one that paces the whole system on state machine one, the one that counts steps on state machine two. We could have changed that around and it would have been fine, right? But we're just picking particular state machines. Um, these, this is all the DMA channels that we're going to use. Again, just to make our code a little bit more readable. What I want to look at next, though, really, is the function which sets up 
the whole driver for a particular motor. So set up motor one, which as an argument, it takes the number of the GPIO pin, the, the, if, the, if there are four inputs, let's see, the motor driver has four digital inputs, zero, one, two, and three. The driver requires that those be sequential GPIOs. It's actually a limitation, sort of a limitation of the PIO system is if you're, you want to send a whole bunch of stuff out through an out command to a collection of pins, those pins have to be sequential. So as an argument, this setup function requires that you specify, I am putting control input zero on this particular GPIO pin, and then it assumes that control input one is on that GPIO pins number plus one. The next one's on that GPIO's number plus two, and so on, right? And then it, it requires that you pass in the name of an interrupt handler. So when that counting state machine gets through all of its counts and throws interrupt zero, we're going to tie an interrupt service routine to that interrupt, right? That interrupt service routine is going to have a name, and we're going to pass the name in there. We do some things to load up these PIO programs. In particular, we call each of their init functions. These are the C functions that live in the .pio files that do things like configure, you know, if there were a clock divider there, we can configure the clock divider and so on. So we call their various init functions. We enable each of the state machines on which we put those PIO programs. And then we configure the interrupts. And I want to pause on this for just a moment because it allows for me to reinforce some of the stuff that we talked about last time. Um, Remember, last time we, were, we did sort of a deep dive on the interrupt system on the RP2040. And as our case study for that system, we were talking about the PWM channel. But I talked about how a lot of the stuff that we were talking about abstracts to the other peripherals, right? You can sort of think about how this maps. And this is an example of that. So in this case, the, the, the interrupt to which we were trying to attach an interrupt service routine is not that PWM wrap interrupt in the interrupt table. Let me, let me just quickly pull this up. We pull up the data sheet here. Let me show you what I'm, remind you what I'm talking about. So if we take a look at the interrupts here, last time, just as a case study to discuss these interrupts, we were talking about PWM or wrap, right? This is the interrupt that's attached to the PWM peripheral. In this particular case, we want to tie an interrupt to an interrupt service routine to a different interrupt, in particular, PIO zero or zero. That's the one that we want to configure this time. So, okay, in order to do that, we talked last time about how configuring these interrupts requires that you kind of talk to two systems. You have to talk to, in this case, the PIO system and say, hey, please turn on your interrupts, right? P please turn on this particular interrupt and please throw that interrupt when the following conditions are met. And then you have to go talk to that NVIC, the nested vector interrupt controller and say, um, please enable this particular interrupt right so that the arm knows that that interrupt is enabled and you specify the interrupt service routine or the exception handler associated with that particular exception and you've told the pio to also turn on that particular interrupt so in this section of code here lines 99 to 102 the two instructions to start with pio those are us talking to the pio peripheral so in particular we're saying um if interrupt zero on PIO coprocessor zero is, is set or is pending, please just clear it, right? And then um, what this line of code is saying is we're specifying the source for PIO interrupt zero to be that ERC zero. So when we say ERC zero in the PIO program, we, what we are doing is tying this interrupt flag, which is visible to the arm nested vector interrupt controller to that particular interrupt. That's what that SM zero is interpreted as. If we had SM one there, then when we said ERC one, then that would throw this particular interrupt to the nested vector interrupt controller. And there's in fact a whole sort of library of conditions under which you can ask for the PIO system to throw this interrupt. Let me show you that. Um, if we go to stepper motors, let's take a look at the line of code that we were just looking at. So we were looking at this one here. 
So we call this function as an argument. This re function requires the uh, the source number, right? And as a source number, I in the code specified PIO INTR SN0 LSB line 685 there. Um, I could alternatively, incidentally, have done this, which is much more readable. The only reason I didn't is because when I put this example together, they hadn't built that into the SDK just yet. I actually discovered this this morning, which is a really nice feature, by the way. It makes the code a lot more readable. Um, but all that's doing is deobfuscating some, some of the C. Deobfuscating C. Does anybody know about the obfuscated C contest? Yeah, one person. Okay, this is going to be a one minute tangent, but you guys are going to love this. Uh, obfuscated C. So this is a challenge. Some of you might enjoy participating in this. The challenge is um, write, you know, here's an objective. You have to write a, a C program that does this. We're going to test that it does this. Do it in the most obscure way that you possibly can. And there's a whole bunch of categories. So this is describing the winners from 2020. Best one-liner, best of show. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah, so this does something. <laughs> and it's kind of a fun exercise to poke through this and go, what the hell is, what are they trying to do here? Um, I don't know, you can, it's fun to poke through these things and just see, that's kind of cool, right? So anyway, this, this is obfuscating C deliberately. What the CSDK is doing for us is deobfuscating that C. So in any case, so those are two instructions to the PIO subsystem. We're saying, hey, clear that interrupt if it's pending. Um, and please attach this particular condition to the ERC zero interrupt flag. And then we go talk to the nested vector interrupt controller and we say, um, for this particular interrupt, when you see this interrupt, please call the exception handler with the name handler, which we pass in as an argument to this function. And then this is another instruction to that nested vector interrupt controller to say, please turn on that particular interrupt, which we dove into this last time. And when we went down through the levels of abstraction, what we found that under the hood there, that's a manipulation of that NVIC underscore ISER register, which is enabling the various interrupt routines. OK, so that sets up the interrupts, and it turns on the various state machines. The next thing that we do is configure all the DMA channels which drive these various state machines. So these two DMA channels here, if we believe the, the comments, the state machine that these are feeding are, uh, this is feeding the state machine that is generating the pulse sequence out to the motors. So the final one that we talked about, the one that just waits for an interrupt and then does an out to the pins. So what you can see here is that channel zero is the one that actually specifies which of those character arrays we want to be sending into the TX FIFO and ultimately out to the pins, right? Do we want for to send the, the sequence of character arrays that causes clockwise rotation or counterclockwise rotation or that for which it just sits still? Okay, so the way that we do this is we go through a few configurations. Um, we, we create a DMA channel config object that we'll call C0 and we get all the default configurations and then we modify some of those default configurations. In particular, we specify that the transfer size, the number of bits that, that will compose each DMA transfer will be eight. We're going to transmit bytes or characters. Um, we specify that the read increment is going to be true. What that meant, means is from DMA transfer zero to DMA transfer one, the read address for this DMA transfer will walk forward by eight bits. It'll move to the next index of that character array. So it allows, it allows for the read pointer to walk down the character array. The write increment is set to false because we're always going to be writing to the same place in memory. We're going to be writing to the TX FIFO for this particular state machine. Um, we then specify this DREC, data request signal. This is, we are specifying um, under what conditions do we want for a DMA transfer to occur? And there's a whole variety that we could set this to. What we're doing in this case is we're saying the DREC is going to be PIO0TX0. What that means is 
when the TX FIFO for PIO0 is emptied through a pull command, execute another instruction to fill it up automatically. So we're pasting the DMA transfers by the speed with which the, state, the PIO state machine empties that FIFO with pull commands. And then we call a chain to command, which means that the way to interpret this is as soon as this DMA channel has finished everything it's supposed to do, chain automatically to DMA channel one, which is this one, so that this one then just runs automatically. And as we'll see, what this does is reconfigure and restart the first one. And then we specify a few things about the channel. We say, okay, uh, this is the channel we're configuring. This is that, that channel config that we've been manipulating up here. This is going to be our write address. The address to which the DMA channel is writing is, uh, it, is it lives in the PIO zero hardware struct. And in particular, it is one of the TX FIFO um, registers. There's a handful of them. We're going to the particular one associated with the pulse state machine. This is the one that we're feeding. So this is the address to which we are writing. This is just pointing to the TX FIFO for this particular state machine. So it just writes to that TX FIFO. This is a pointer to the address from which we are reading. So remember further up there, we had those, those three character arrays, right? One for forward motion, one for reverse motion, one for standing still. This is when we specify, call that API function to specify the direction that we want for the motor to turn, we are modifying the address to which this points so that we automatically switch this TMA channel from looking at the forward character sequence to the reverse character sequence, right? But it's always just looking to the address pointed to by this variable here a pointer to an address. I, I debugged this for like two days because I just had the address here. No, it's a pointer to an address. God. Um, the number of transfers that we want executed, this is just the length of that character array. It's eight because we're half stepping the motor. Click, 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 click. False means don't start this immediately. We're gonna start it collectively with another one. So what that means is this will go through and paste by those pull commands. It executes eight DMA transfers once it finishes, it automatically chains to this next DMA channel. What this one does, uh, so I'll just, I'll point out the differences. We're doing 32 bit transactions here. We're not incrementing our read pointer. We're not incrementing our write pointer and we're chaining back to the first channel. So as soon as this one finishes, the first one runs again. Um, the address to which this DMA channel is writing is the read address of the first DMA channel. Because after that first one is finished, its read address has walked all the way to the end of that array. We need to put that read address back to the beginning. That's what this DMA channel does. It writes to the read address register of that DMA channel. And the data that it writes is, is a pointer to the address of the first element of that array to, that we're sending to the state machine, right? We're just resetting the conditions. This only does one transaction. As soon as this transaction finishes, the first one runs again. But now when it runs, we've reset its read pointer back to the beginning. So it just starts walking back up again. So we're largely out of, we're, we're out of time at this point. But if you scroll down here on your own time, what you'll find is another pair of DMA channels that do largely the same thing. They're just feeding a different one of those PIO state machines. This one's feeding the state machine that's responsible for pacing the speed with which the motor turns. And then you'll find a final DMA channel that specifies the number of steps through which we want for the motor to rotate. This one has no corresponding partner that resets and restarts it because starting this DMA channel is what starts a whole maneuver. So we would actually like to do that from software. So in our C code, we say start DMA channel four, and then that starts a whole maneuver. Okay. So I'll be in lab in like 15 minutes. I'll see many of you there. <laughs>